Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I am very excited to share the conversation I had with Richard Reeves. Richard is a senior fellow in economic studies, where he holds the John C. and Nancy D. Whitehead Chair at Brookings Institute. He's also the director of the Future of the Middle Class Initiative, and much of his research is on the middle class uh, and various inequalities. He is the author of various books, including the most uh, recent and well-received of Boys and Men, Why the Modern Male is Struggling, Why it Matters, and What to Do About It. Um, And that's what we talk about in this conversation. We start the conversation by talking about why he wrote this book on boys and men. We talk about, do we have to talk about uh, issues that uh, surround or affect or impact women and uh, uh, men's issues at the same time, or can we you know, have these conversations separately? We talk about some of the major structural issues for men, such as in academics and in the workplace. We talk about the gender pay gap. We talk about how masculinity has to evolve in the 21st century. We talk about some of the challenges for men in both black and Latino um, races. We talk about various economic classes. We talk about some of the political rights failed answers uh, for men and masculinity. We talk about some of the political left's uh, failed answers on men and masculinity. And we end the conversation by talking about some of his solutions, such as uh, HEAL, which is uh, sort of analogous to STEM. You know, this was uh, a conversation I was very much looking forward to. Um, Richard's been uh, making the rounds uh, on various appearances, um, and so he's been well sought after, and obviously he does uh, great work um, on, on many topics. And, you know, reading his book, and I've talked about it on the podcast and other places, you know, uh, there's many issues out there and we have to talk honestly about what those issues are. And yes, we have to talk about some of the issues that uh, specifically or, or maybe dramatically impact uh, boys and men. Uh, we talk about in the conversation and I really feel strongly about this. If, you, if there's a void, if people stop talking to a certain group of people, um, whomever they may be, well, that void's going to get filled. And it's going to get filled um, sometimes with some pretty horrible things or from bad faith actors or bad incentives. And I think we see that in a lot of ways. And I think we definitely see that with, with boys and men. And obviously, there's no one size fits all here. There's no one answer for everything. But we do have to, much as we talk about many of the issues for women and for, for, uh, for young women, we have to talk about issues that uh, impact uh, young men and, and, and men in general. And um, I think both are important uh, for sure. And, you know, his, his book is uh, very, very balanced. Um, it's very, very fair. It's very honest. It's very, um, you know, trying to find the pragmatic solutions to, to many of the things that impact boys and men. And we need more voices like uh, Richard. And so now I bring you Richard Reeves. I'm here with Richard Reeves. Uh, Richard, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I'm very excited to talk to you. Thanks, Xavier. Thank you for having me on. Of course. Uh, You've written a fantastic book called Of Boys and Men, Why the Modern Male is Struggling, Why it Matters, and What to Do About It. Uh, It's been getting around everywhere. People are talking about it. They're writing about it. They're, you know, talking to you about it. So I get the sense that um, this was kind of like a passion of sorts, like you really felt strongly about this, and you kind of mentioned in the beginning of the book, and so, and I've I've read other pieces and stuff that you really coming from like a good place, not like a you know mean spirited or winning points kind of thing, but you really felt a uh, uh, passion about it. Uh, what was the, the the reasoning for for writing it? I guess. Yeah, and I think it's important that caveat you just added with what kind of passion, because this is not an area that needs more polemics. Yeah, for sure. Um, there's plenty of those around. It's an area that needs more authoritative, call it as you see it, attempts to just you know look look these problems in the face and do something about it. And, and I, I guess what I became passionate about was the need to have this conversation mm-hmm. and just to have a good faith conversation about hey, what's happening with our what's happening with our you know, our boys and men right now, and what should we do about it? And in some ways, I think precisely because it is quite a, a weighted or freighted conversation. Mm-hmm. That makes it even more important, you know, because mm-hmm. otherwise there's a bit of a selection problem. If if you if you're sort of quite a boring 
person like me, you know, I'm a policy wonk at the Brookings Institution with all my charts and policy ideas. Mm -hmm. If we're if we're scared off the ground, that means the ground is left to those who have a you know a point to score, or maybe even to use your phrase, maybe there's some sort of mean spirit and some sort of negative emotion driving them to the space mm -hmm. other than the mm -hmm. positive one of promoting human flourishing. And so that that led me, I think, to become relatively determined mm -hmm. to try and make a contribution in this space, and to some extent, helped just give permission to have a better conversation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I want to dive right into it. Just real quick, give us the brief potted biography of yourself, of where you're at, what your background is, and, and what you uh, where you're, what you currently do. So I'm a British American. I became a proud U.S. citizen six years ago. Oh, nice. Um, and every year I take out a letter from the president reminding me of the responsibilities of citizenship. Uh, That's cool. Uh, which, I, which I find a really good annual ritual. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a beautiful letter. Actually, it was President Obama at the time, but it's just beautifully written mm -hmm. and saying, look, you, you being a citizen is a thing. Right? And mm -hmm. I come from the UK where we're subjects, not, not citizens. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I have an American wife. My kids are British American. And came to DC about ten years ago to to actually to switch over because we wanted to raise our kids, finish raising our kids in the in the US. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but before that, I'd worked in government journalism and policy in the UK, including in the Cameron Clegg coalition. So I've essentially sort of bounced around the world of policy wonkery, journalism, and government uh, for most of my uh, career. Uh, it's just that the, no, I've now landed at the Brookings Institution where I'm a senior fellow and I work on issues around inequality and social social mobility and now increasingly on family and gender. And the book is published by the Brookings Institution Press, I'm proud mm -hmm. to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Brookings is great. Brookings is, is, is a very nice uh, outfit. So, okay, so you, you were kind of alluding to it here. So this has nowadays a... People get very nervous about talking about masculinity, uh, you know, men, boy, young boys, things like that. And we'll get into some of the some of the numbers of it, which is always fun for me. I guess the one thing I want to ask though is why is this fraught with so much uh, contention, right? And also, this becomes a you have to talk about women's issues or you have to talk about certain, whatever second, third, fourth wave, whatever feminism, it can never be just like dudes have their own set of problems and you know, women do as well, but, um, we're just going to talk about men's issues and it always feels like there has to be a caveat or a juxtaposition. And so should we talk about them always at the same time? Can they have their own space to just talk about them? How, how do we understand this kind of landscape in which we're we're trying to dialogue on on men's issues well that's actually a really a really thoughtful framing for for the challenge because i i think to some extent there's a there's a bad reason why we always have to talk about like the why you can't talk about men without talking about women at the same time and there's a good reason the bad reason is if it's always framed in zero sum right there's, yeah. there's something here which is right by definition you 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 frame this as on one or one or the other, but the good reason uh, is that to some extent some of the problems of boys and men and women and girls uh, affect each other. Mm. We're not in isolation, and sure. so there is clearly overlap. So when men struggle in various ways, that can affect women. So if men are struggling economically, for example, that can put more pressure on women. But equally, if there's been a profound change in the economic relationship between men and women, which we may get to, and there's a big argument in my book that affects men. Mm -hmm. And so the economic position of women is not something that's irrelevant to the cultural position of men. All that said, I I also believe we need some space to look at the gender specific problems that boys and men and women and girls may have for different reasons. So just to give one hopefully relatively non-controversial example, the ways in which the internet and particular high-speed internet and smartphones and social media and so on have affected uh, boys versus girls and men versus women are rather different. They've mm. had quite different effects. And I think understanding that is very important to then thinking about what, if anything, we do about them. And you know, there's just a, just a new study out relatively recently showing the mental health effects of social media use just almost exclusively for girls rather than boys. That doesn't mean boys don't have their own boys right. and men their own issues with the internet, but they are different. Mm -hmm. So I think the ability to think differently about some of the problems is necessary if we're going to look at solutions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I I very much agree with that. 
Do you, you mentioned in the book a whole host of issues, major issues with men today. Uh, there was other ones that I, I co- also could have added to the list too. Some of them here are the gender gap in college degrees awarded, inequalities of race and class, structural issues, uh, ineffectiveness of social policy interventions, stalemate on sex and gender, lack of practical solutions. I would also add there's many physical things as well. Some uh, boys and men are, are more prone to certain heart issues and more prone to neurodevelopmental issues. There, there's all these you know physical and mental health uh, aspects as well. Um, if you were to, if you were to, if you were to give your elevator pitch, <laughs> right? What's the, what are these like two or three major kind of structural issues with, with men and boys today, as, as far as trying to diagnose a kind of problem of sorts? Well, I'm glad you use the word structural because as you alluded to a moment ago, I, I really focus very strongly on what are the structural causes mm-hmm. of the problems of boys and men rather than this individualistic route. Of just like well it's just I, it's their fault in one way or the other whether that's because they're too toxic or they're not masculine enough depending mm-hmm. on your political priors mm-hmm. but I, I think in the education system it seems pretty clear to me now that there are structural disadvantages facing boys and men of course everything we're about to talk about will be on an average right some of the just the distributions overlap although some overlap more than others and so in higher education now there's a bigger gender gap than there was in 1972 when Title IX was passed to promote girls and women in education. So the, the sort of data point there is that in 72, men are 13 percentage points more likely to get a four-year college degree. Today, women are 15 percentage points more likely to get a four-year college degree. So it's not just the gap's been closed, a bigger gap, the gap mm-hmm. has actually opened up and it's slightly bigger now than on the other side. And there are other big gaps in education that precede that, of course, but that's a that's a good expression of the huge gap in education, I think, because the education system doesn't suit boys and men on average as well as girls and women. Mm-hmm. In the economy, there's really been a really pretty dramatic shock, especially in the US, to working class men. The fact that most American men earn less today than they did in 19 than most American men did in 1979 mm. is pretty striking. The fact there's actually been wage, wage stagnation. Mm-hmm. For, the major- for the majority of, uh, of, of, of that bit of the male population is quite extraordinary. And the US is a bit of an outlier there. Male wages have been sluggish pretty much everywhere, but but flatlining or backwards. So that's a huge change. Of course, at the top, both men and women have seen have seen rises because we've seen growing economic inequality. And then there's been just these profound changes in the family, which don't necessarily imply problems for, for men, but in practice have done so because we haven't updated our models of the family and of fatherhood to meet the modern world. So when you know, 40% of kids are now born outside marriage in the US, most kids to non-college educated Americans. 40% of households have a primary uh, a female breadwinner. And 40% of women earn more than the median man, mm. whereas in 79, it was 13%. So that tells us that the wage distributions have really caught up. And so there's been this very welcome, profound change in the economic positions of women relative to men, which was the central goal of the post-war women's movement. Mm-hmm. And it has been spectacularly achieved, not completely, but but right. the the trends, in, I mean, just uh, it, it's an amazing achievement. Mm-hmm. But it has then meant that the questions of what does it mean to be a man, to be a father, are being asked with an urgency mm-hmm. that right. have never been before. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I, I definitely want to come to that that bit of it. Let's just hover on academics and, and workplace for a minute. So one of the things you mentioned as problematic in the work in the in academia, and then it's one of your solutions, which we can kind of or, or one of your, your uh, uh, potential solutions, I should say, um, is this this fact of, you know, because as you were saying that, you know, um, so many girls are graduating more from high school than boys. Um, 57% of bachelors are awarded to women and it's decreasing for men. Um, there's all of these different components at the, you know, primary and secondary. And then if you get into obviously college and graduate school, just kind of across the board, um, there, as you were alluding to, this wasn't the case for, for women 50 years ago. It wasn't the case 30 years ago. Uh, even 20 years ago, I mean, there's, there's been progressively moving in the right direction. And, and one of the things that was wanted is, is equality, you know, that, that men and women could, you know, go and get an education and get a degree and all these things. And now it seems that it's slightly shifted in some ways where now women are outpacing men in academia on pretty much all levels. And I don't Mm. think that it's obviously wrong that women are doing so well in, you know, education. That's a fantastic thing. That's a wonderful thing. We want that. 
But it does seem to say, well, what's happening academically here with why boys aren't or men aren't able to, you know, maintain or 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 you know, kind of keep pace here. Uh, what do we what do we think is some of the the challenges there that are contributing to that? Yeah. So what's happened is that the taking off of the brakes on women's educational opportunities and aspirations, or if you prefer, the ceiling that was previously put on mm -hmm. girls and women. By removing that, what we've just exposed is that they are actually naturally somewhat better in the current education system. So <laughs> we've exposed, it took, it took getting rid of these sexist ceilings to expose the natural advantages that girls and women have in education. So I, we've talked about college, but if you look at the, you know, the highest GPA score is a two thirds girls. Now the lowest GPA score is in high school. I'm talking about our, our boys mm. in the typical U S school district. Now the girls are almost a grade level ahead in English between mm. grades four and eight. And mm. they've caught up in math in poorer school districts that are ahead in both mm. uh, and pretty much you, you really struggle now to find anywhere in the education system where uh, boys or men are ahead you can do it so you can just sort of ah but in advanced right. math in right. advanced math ap or something so you can right. write there's still a 52 percent, whatever it is mm -hmm. so you can if you if you hunt long enough and hard enough you can find them but as a general proposition girls and women are ahead of boys and men at every level of the education system in every in every subject and in every mm -hmm. and in every part of the country basically mm -hmm. with much bigger gaps for poorer communities and in sure. black communities so mm -hmm. the the more disadvantaged the situation you find yourself in much bigger the gender gap is going to be and i think that's because the education system rewards certain skills and behaviors that are about paying attention to detail looking ahead the ability to defer gratification, impulse control, et cetera, all of which develop more strongly in girls and women than in men. But much more importantly, for my purposes, they develop much earlier mm -hmm. in girls and men. You then have a growing feminization of the teaching profession. And only 24% of K-12 teachers now are men, down from 33%. And you just add all that up. And actually what that means is that there's, a, I think, a real danger that we get to a tipping point where the very idea of educational success is going to become a feminine characteristic, mm -hmm. which is almost unthinkable given mm -hmm. where we were. I mean, when I went to college in the late 80s, we were at parity. And mm -hmm. No one really expected the lines to just keep going. So nobody predicted that women and girls wouldn't just catch up, would blow right past and keep going. And so we're all reeling a bit from the mm -hmm. extraordinary pace and extent of this educational overtaking. But I don't think it's I don't think it's possible to look at the results and not conclude there's something structural in the education system mm -hmm. that's favoring girls and women, not least because the same patterns are basically true across every advanced economy. This mm -hmm. is not some quirk of the US K-12 system. They vary a little bit in degree, but it's true everywhere. Yeah. Well, well, <clears throat> this has implications then, I would think, uh, naturally so, or, or maybe you know, it's not too hard to see that. Um, this is going to have challenges when you're out in the workforce and when you're trying to find a job, right? There's, you know, there's, there's many, there's some overlap there. And so, I mean, you mentioned, I mean, I might, I think I have these numbers, right, but one out of three men with a high school diploma are out of the labor force, which is about 5 million men and, and 9 million pre COVID of prime age. You explain what prime age is in the book, but we're out of the workforce. So, I mean, that's, I mean, reading those numbers on a page was like really sobering. It was like, wow, that is a lot of people. Um, and 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 then the picture for women is different. You know, women, you know, make up you know twenty four percent now of senior executives, gainfully employed in many positions. We can talk about the gender pay gap in a minute, but just kind of structurally here, big picture, you're seeing this also in the workforce in different categories. No, it's not just in. Um, you know, white collar jobs. I think it's maybe in blue collar jobs too. It's it's in a lot of different domains. No, it's it's you're seeing this in a, in a pervasive way. Yes, although really only in, in mostly in one direction. So we're seeing this gender desegregation of the labor market with with women entering professions that were previously very male, uh, and with and with incredible speed, especially higher status jobs, as I think you've just referred to. So. So areas law, like medicine yeah, think, yeah, yeah 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 i mean they're great examples because they used you know they used to be you know very male and now they're 50 50. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think it's probably a long time since most of us have heard the phrase female doctor or female lawyer uh -huh. because it's just that's kind of weird in a world uh -huh. where where we're half of them. And, that, and again it's just happened with breathtaking speed uh, mm -hmm. and even in subjects like stem 
I mean, you just tripled the number of women up to about 28% of STEM jobs and under by women. Still an underrepresentation areas like engineering and tech, but wow, even there, the, the numbers have gone up hugely. And, and the, the most important thing is a direct is directionally the trends are going in the in the right right direction. And so there's a problem here, which is if you only look at the very, very top. Let's say you look at Fortune 500 companies mm -hmm. and you look at CEOs, right? So you look at the apex of the apex. It's still, I think it's what, 45 of the CEOs of Fortune 500 are, are companies are women, something like that. Mm -hmm. I think when I checked in the way, it's like 44, something like that. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, so there's still, well, that, that's a long way from parity, but it's also 45 more than we had 20 years ago, mm -hmm. 30 years ago when there were none. And yeah. so, even in those areas at the apex, you're, you're seeing representation that may not be at parity yet, but it's still just, you know, just a different world to the one we saw before. And one final example, which is not in the book, but it's top of mind for me now because of you know, UK politics, mm -hmm. just obviously had our third female prime minister mm -hmm. in the UK. She was a complete disaster, but uh, the fact that she was a woman didn't, didn't really matter. She was just like a disaster. And actually, if you look at British members of parliament now, a third of them are women. Mm. And it was 5% when Thatcher became prime minister. So just oh. like, like you've gone oh. from a world where like <laughs> Thatcher was one of one in 20 members of parliament women, and now it's a third, wow. which again, it's not 50%, but a third is like, so across a whole range of domains, we've seen just extraordinary progress for women. Um, but as I, as we were alluded to in many areas, just men stalling or falling. Yeah. So, so, so tell us about, about the gender pay gap. So people get really, really upset about this. So there's the, the much cited numbers, which I think are, uh, probably not the whole story, but if, what is it? 80 cents to the dollar for women to men or whatever it is. And then if, if you're, um, if you're, if you're black or if you're lat if a, if you're a black woman or a Latin woman, it's like 60 cents and then 55 cents or something like that. I mean, it's just this wide gap. <clears throat> But others have suggested that the gap is there's a variety of uh, reasons why it and, and the gap may be that because of not things only which are gender, the female gender, it might be other reasons. Um, I guess uh, most accurately, what, what's the like kind of the accurate story here? If it's if a, if it's a multivariate problem, right, and it has you need multivariate solutions to that and it's, you can't say directly race or gender like that's a, a variable but there's many things that are you know experience education um whatever um uh, uh, position you may hold you know amount of employee there's so many variables mm -hmm. that are there how can we know accurately where where that that actual pay gap is between men and women well i think the gender pay gap is a great example of the broader problem so it's interesting in itself but of the broader problem to just not dig into one side of a culture war and so if you ask some people about the gender pay gap, and I'm getting a little bit of this criticism myself, which is they'll say, oh, it's a myth, right? It's gender pay gap is a myth. And right. you see that stuff on YouTube. And mm -hmm. I've had people on Twitter saying, this guy still thinks there's a gender pay gap, so I'm going to ignore him. And well, there is, there actually is a gender pay gap. You yes, there is. Like, analyze yes, there is. the data. And yes. in just the same way that all the, all the other data, like just there's a gender gap in college degrees as well, mm -hmm. right? It's mm -hmm. just, that's, it's not a myth, it's math. <laughs> the question is, why is there that gap? And that's where the other side get it wrong. Because on the mm -hmm. left, you'll get there's this gender pay gap, say whatever it is, depending on how you measure, 82 cents on the dollar. And that just shows you that there remains pervasive discrimination against women in the labor market. That's mm -hmm. also not true. Mm -hmm. That used to be a significant part of the story, perhaps, but it is not true today. Mm -hmm. The reason we have a gender pay gap now is for two big reasons. One, parenting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, women track men pretty well in terms of their earnings until they have kids, and then kaboom! It's yeah. like being hit by a meteorite if you're a woman, and men's earnings continue to go. So that's the main reason. And then secondly, some occupational segregation, which is mm -hmm. that you know women are on average in occupations that pay less than men, and the men in those occupations typically earn less as well, and vice versa. So those two things put together basically quotes explain most of the gender pay gap. There's a little bit left over, but that's that's most of it. Mm -hmm. But weirdly, and I was looking at some survey data on this recently, the more educated the person you ask the question of, the more likely they are to think that the pay gap is because of discrimination against mm -hmm. women doing the same jobs as men. And that's just, it's not true, but it's widely believed. And the more educated you are, the more likely you are to believe that thing that's not true. And I just think it's basically a, 
a, a truth that's held on the left. It's like if you're mm-hmm. on the left. And then the other thing, alluding to your point about having to intersect by race and gender, is that yes, if you compare against white men, you get those startling numbers. But I find it much more interesting to point out that white women earn much more than black men now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For every dollar a white woman earns, a black man only earns 84 cents, which is about the same as the overall gender pay gap. And you go back to 79, that wasn't true. White women have blown past black men in the labor market. Mm -hmm. And so if we're going to take intersectionality seriously, we've got to look at, we've got to look at the fact that black men earn so much less than white women. And it's basically a very complex story about, but the gender pay gap is pretty clearly now a parenting and occupation gap, which means that if you're trying to fix it, you have to think well beyond the just the old story about discrimination. There's basically no evidence that that's, and of course, it's very elite. It's illegal to pay women less for doing the same job. Yeah, no, it's, it's it's an important point, and it, it, my my understanding of this when when people will say this is well. I do believe there's obviously a gap. I mean, you're saying the numbers are what they are, but I don't think it's a because of, you know, mass and gross amounts of patriarchy. I mean, there might be, you know, ripples of that. There might be elements of that in certain sectors, but I don't, you look at all the other things as well. The women are doing very well in many ways, at least in a quote unquote Western world. But also it seems like the left isn't updating their data points. They're, they they have their their kind of talking point, their rhetoric, and it's like, yes, and we're never gonna we're never gonna get rid of that, even if things change or update. And the right seems to just, you know, live on, you know, Earth two or whatever. And, and <laughs> it doesn't exist right. at all, which is ridiculous. It's not right? true. It's, it's not it's, true. It's, it's 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 a myth. And of course, the better argument would be the right saying. There is a gender pay gap because women are choosing to spend time with their children, and that's a yeah. good thing, and we should yeah. honor that choice. And if the result is they own less, well, so be it. As long as we're sure that they're choosing, that's entirely up to them. And the left would say, well, no, 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 that's because of gendered expectations about the division of childcare, and actually we should be doing much more to try and break that down. And it's because women are social. That's 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 a good argument. Yeah, that, that's, that's, the a, argument that's a good should, dialogue to have. Yeah. That's 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 the sub that would be the substance that would be mm-hmm. the, the argument of substance between left and right as opposed to the it's all patriarchy it's all a myth which right. is what we currently get which is what they right. which is not really a debate at all no it's, it's not just, it's just it's just a meeting of equal untruths right <laughs> yes yes and there's there's elements of signaling there you know how much of my side are you on all these things exactly. so, so there's there's this one big thing in the book that you talk about it's something i've been thinking about for so long i've mentioned it with other conversations here on the on the podcast Okay, so if you go back to 1950, 1960, 1970, and we understand how women were, you mentioned some of this earlier, in many places <clears throat> that women weren't in the workforce in the way that they are now, you know, even 1985, 1990. But, you know, so this was different. So in many ways, women had, on average, you know, kind of your quote unquote traditional way of, of doing things, which was, you know, your uh, uh, stay at home wife and mother and, you know, kind of those things, which I, I'm not saying are wrong. I, there's still many women that really enjoy that and get value of that. And that is a very valuable thing to do. And I, I don't think we should demonize people that choose to do that. But, you know, we have so much advancement. <clears throat> and so as when people talk about equality you know, with women and, you know, they, became, they can work and do whatever a man can do if they want in the workforce out in society, which is good. Um, it seems to me that that's only half the, the, the answer. The answer would be, well, if that, if, if that, you know, tide rises, we have to then say, well, what does that say or do or change for men? And masculinity in the 21st century? Because as you're saying with the gender pay thing, I don't think it's entirely um, I don't want to say fair. Maybe, maybe some people would say that. I don't think it's. Um, there's no equanimity there. Of well, <laughs> you have to if you want to do your as a woman. If I want to do my career, and I also want to have children, but you know, I have to kind of make a choice, or I have to settle, or I have to figure things out. Or women can try and do both, but it's very much a lot of pressure. It's a lot of work. Well, that means that men can't just go out and, you know, provide, you know, using again, the traditional kind of trope, there has to be also a shifting there for men as well. I think in terms of masculinity, in terms of the home, in terms of fatherhood, in terms of in society. So how do we see as we're in, and this is something I think is an important question, as we see forward thinking into the 21st century, right? We're two decades into the 21st century. 
how do we update how how we understand or view what it means to be a man to masculinity where where there can be more uh equanimity between division of labor in a home or in society or in the workforce or you know what they bring in economically for their nuclear family or extended family etc how, how do we see that or how do you think we we can you know have that conversation of what that looks like to evolve and, and change for 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 men hmm. Well, that's that's the million dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> so, because I, I think everything that we've been discussing up until leads to that point, which is the need to rescript masculinity mm -hmm. and the male role for a world of growing and close to gender equality and of women's economic independence. Mm -hmm. Because if we remain stuck in the old model of you know sole or main provider protector provider then we're, we're getting we're going to get benched basically yeah. um because of these changes and and the conservatives of the 1970s were right to worry about that they were right to say hold on if women get economic independence what are we going to do with the guides mm -hmm. they were wrong to say that we'd all be marauding around like in mad max style <laughs> clans uh, actually we've retreated if anything here, here the internet may have saved us ironically uh -huh. <laughs> because it's given given men a place to go but the way i think about this is that we 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 make choices and you've used that word choice a lot and i think that's critical the substantive choice but we do so within social scripts yeah yeah so we still need scripts even if they are not as determinative as they used to be we don't want them to be and i the way i think about this is that we have an old script for femininity you've described mm -hmm. it traditional wife mother we tore, we tore that up and provided a new script for femininity in women, which was, you go, girl, economic empowerment, educational excellence. Make sure you can stand on your own two feet. Right. Make sure that even if you're choosing to stay at home, it's a real choice because you have labor market power. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be exercising your labor market power every day to have it. Mm -hmm. And that's what changes the fundamental economic relationship. We did the same with We tore up the script for masculinity as well, the one my dad had, right? Mine, yeah. When he was became unemployed, he had to go get another job. That was mm -hmm. my mom did work as a part-time nurse, but the clear division of labor was there. Mm -hmm. So he had a script to follow within which he made his choices. But we've torn that script up. We haven't replaced it. Mm -hmm. And so there's a scriptlessness to modern masculinity. The way I think about men today, especially those who don't have economic power or resources, is that they're in the middle of the stage. They've had the script torn up in front of them and they're expected to perform and they improvise because that's what you have to do but so i feel like what we're doing right now is we're improvising masculinity in this completely changed world mm -hmm. whereas the women and girls around us have quite a strong script of mm -hmm. empowerment mm -hmm. um so we've taken away the old patriarchal script if you want to call it that we haven't replaced it with a pro-social script for masculinity mm -hmm. which is compatible with gender equality but doesn't just dissolve masculinity right we don't have to be androgynous to be equal. Mm -hmm. but what that means in practice is thinking about fatherhood as equal to but complementary to motherhood. We mm -hmm. don't have to be doing it equally all the time, but we do have a role to play. It means expanding the role of men in the community, et cetera, finding more places for men to have leadership roles and status beyond and above the usual and old standards, et cetera, and, re and renegotiating the space that we have between men and women. And I don't have great answers on this yet, but I do I do hope that we're at least starting to ask the question seriously because mm -hmm. there's a danger otherwise that it's either Josh Hawley on the right saying, let's go back. Let's go back. We need we need families where it's one breadwinner, one stay at home, but they don't say wife and husband, but you know where they go, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's but when men had factory jobs and real men or it's the left, it's the American Psychological Association or, you know, whoever it is, who are just like, it's all socialized. And the only the only thing to do with masculinity is to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. If we could just mm -hmm. somehow wipe the world free of masculinity in all its forms, then the world would be a better place. And in between those two absurd extremes lie 99% of us trying mm -hmm. to figure this out in a world that's being changed beyond recognition in many ways wonderfully. But also, it's disorienting. Let's mm -hmm. just be honest about that. It doesn't it don't, doesn't make you anti-feminist to suggest that many of these changes are disorienting, especially for men who don't have the power that many of us are lucky enough to have. It's much easier if you've got economic power um, to negotiate these changes. It's still challenging, but it's doable. Let's try try telling it to a working class man who's lost his livelihood, doesn't know what to do, who doesn't you know doesn't know how to look after his kids. He's in a collapsing working class community. Tell him that he's a patriarch, mm -hmm. and 
and get ready for a mouth, an earful in response mm -hmm. quite mm -hmm. rightly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you, you, you say it really nicely. I mean, I totally agree with you 100%. I mean, uh, yeah, on, on the whole right thing, I, I, I've said this to many people, friends I have on the left, it's like, look, when there's a void or when there's a problem, if you don't fill that or you don't give solutions that are balanced and can reach many different types of people, then the other person's going to fill the void with all of their bullshit and they're going to fill it with things that are regressive and 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 not equal and 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 so it's one of these things where it's like how do we we have all these these kind of competing ideas and it's always the most like you know extreme uh uh boundaries and it's <laughs> the average you know person walking around your neighborhood or your community is like yeah i don't like any of these ideas that's wild like i i'm just kind of like here kind of in, in that in that in that middle because i think most people are are temperate and, and moderate in how they're seeing things and they've realized that life's complicated people are complicated and we're evolving and changing and we need to figure that out that there's a continuum of sorts and so you know i think that's that's the real the real real crux of the issue there the yeah, I mean, um, most people most people can think two two thoughts at once and it's something <laughs> right, right. that something i'm thinking about quite a lot at the moment we're obviously in political season right now mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. it is what what makes a problem become a grievance mm. and my answer essentially i think it's the same as yours is neglect mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right take a problem and neglect it and it will become a grievance that's right yeah and then it can then it, then, it, then it can be exploited for grievance politics ends and so like mm. that's why i actually say to a lot of people kind of in establishment in, in the world in which i work which is very find myself saying this is our fault even like andrew tate this you know mm -hmm. misogynist internet person, he's our fault that's right. Like, to the extent that, to the like, why is that? Why is there a demand? Mm -hmm. right? Like, who's mm -hmm. created that demand? And we've created demand exactly. Xavier, your line about a void is very similar to the language I talk about a vacuum, but I like the void. Mm -hmm. It's just, mm -hmm. and guess what? It, well, it's, it's going to get filled. nature abhors a vacuum. So. That, that's right. It's going to get filled, and then it's going to get incentivized, and it's going to get monetized, and it's going to get tribalized, and that's where we're at. I mean, that's 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 the reality of this, and that's a that becomes problematic because that's that is like a, a poison on on either side of this that corrodes the the very fundamental structures of our institutions in many many things in in, in the united states and in, in other other countries as well and that's we we can't let that happen i mean it's like you know I, I, again it's kind of a political season so i'm thinking about this and you know there's a, all these you know clips of obama going around and you know doing the thing he does the best or one of the things he does best and i always just scratch my head and i'm like we had the playbook like we had the playbook talking having a broad coalition talking to all different types of people yeah you didn't have to agree with everything he said or did but it was it, everyone was trying to talk to you know all sorts of people right you know big big coalition and that's just evaporated it's just evaporated and so what happens with that void is then it, it would just fill it with all this junk and and it and it becomes really corrosive if there's no brakes on it right we just go on like 120 miles and we got no brakes and it's as you know in terms of culture and it's like we have to we're gonna come up for air and say whoa wait a minute and that, that that's a i think a, a really really big issue mm -hmm. uh, um just real quick uh a few things here you, you mentioned some of the racial components here, some of the class components, and then some of the initiatives. So you, you spent a chapter talking about um, uh, black boys and black men um, and how it is really tough for for them. So maybe just you know just chat about that briefly, um, and and then I guess <laughs> not not because I'm, I'm I'm partially Latin, but you know also what does it what does it look like for the you know Latinos and 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 that ethnicity as well? Because I mean they're a big group, big ethnicity, but it also it's not in the book, but I don't know if you have any data on that as well of, of what that you know fastest growing you know, uh, you know group uh, in the United States. Where where does that sit as well? So maybe just chat about that. Sure. So the idea of toxic masculinity, which is uh -huh. one I'm very critical of, is you know we just as uh, my godson, who's in the book, said to me that I didn't. He did. This is not in the book, but you know, he said, "Yeah, the idea of toxic masculinity is not a new one for black men." Mm -hmm. like that's that. That you think about super wolf pack, super predator, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and the, all, all the surveys showing that black men in particular are seen as just seen seen as a threat in, mm -hmm. on various in very physically in all kinds of ways. But then you look at the hard data, and what you see is that on pretty much all the measures we've talked about, the, the gap is just bigger for yeah. black 
black men. I mean, just there are already we're at two college degrees going to black women for every one going to black men. Mm. Um, it's long been the case that most breadwinners in black families are women, mm -hmm. uh, etc. And obviously, that's the whole story about incarceration and the, the war on crime becoming a war on black men, etc., and so on. So, basically, the 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 social science point is just that. Like, if you want to find a group to really worry about, then I'd suggest you start with black boys and men on pretty much every measure. Mm. But also, it's helpful because, in terms of the overall argument, because for me at least, it's pretty clear that black men, boys and men, are not worse off despite being male, mm. but in many cases because they're male. Mm. Their masculinity is a disadvantage. And mm. on pretty much every measure that seems to be true so if you were to just to do a thought experiment where you're behind like a, a veil of ignorance and you 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 know you know you know let's say you're going to know your race or your gender but not the other right if you know you know if you know you're white and you get to choose your sex then everything else equal you probably should choose male just mm -hmm. based on the data but if you're black you'd almost certainly choose the other way around mm -hmm. because i'm pretty much every i'm pretty much every measure um, black women are doing better than black men which is mm -hmm. not to say that they've caught up or that they don't still face huge problems sure. you know all the usual caveats, I hope, are, are just assumed in our conversation at that point. Mm -hmm. But the sharp end of many of these changes, family changes, economic changes, really being felt by by black boys and men. As far mm -hmm. as Hispanic men are concerned, the story is a little bit more complicated because mm -hmm. there are some aspects, some ways in which actually Hispanic men are doing very well in terms mm -hmm. of upward mobility, et cetera. Uh, educationally, they're still lagging uh, Hispanic girls and women, for sure, uh, mm -hmm. who've gone kind of way past them. Family formation, some somewhere between the two, between between white and black. Mm -hmm. but one of the difficulties, I think, with really saying anything conclusive about what's happening in our current culture, I'd be really interested to know your views on this, about what's happening kind of with Hispanic men and women is because it's predominantly an immigrant group, first mm -hmm. or second generation immigrants, very upwardly mobile, self-selected mm -hmm. for all kinds of characteristics that come along with being an immigrant or a second generation immigrant. It's just really hard to know what the equilibrium is going to be. Mm -hmm. I think we got we have to wait a generation or two to see kind of what's going on because right right now you've got this highly self-selected group who are very upwardly mobile from very often a low position and still facing huge problems for sure um but but incredible very high employment rates for example so just yeah. take that employment I mean like prime age prime age employment rates among Hispanic men are higher than any, I think any, almost any other group with the mm -hmm. exception of Asians but just really high employment rates mm -hmm. and so very different kinds of problems but I don't I, I don't that's my that's my sort of semi thought through response but I'd love to know your view yeah yeah I mean briefly I mean it's it is complicated the things I've tried to tell folks is you know, my dad was a, an immigrant here and he's been here you know, 40 plus years now. Um, you know, my wife's an immigrant here as well, and she's been here for 20 years. And so, you know, in, in my family, in, in different, in different parts of my family, um, you know, it's different, right? So, I mean, I think this is true in general, but it was just with Latinos. I mean, it's, um, you know, how you immigrate here. Uh, is it because of conflict or is it because of economics? When do you immigrate here? Uh, did you immigrate here in the 80s, the 90s, 2000s? You know, there's different waves of this stuff. And then where do you land? Do you land in a city? Do you land in, you know, out west? Do you land in, you know, so it, it's, you know, Latinos in Miami are different than Latinos in West Texas and Nevada and Arizona and Latinos in LA and, and right here in, in DC. And so it, it's very different. And, and What's interesting is that, you know, different immigration waves from different countries. I mean, each country, you know, each region of sorts is wildly different. I mean, there's all these mm. sub kind of cultural things. So South America is demonstrably different than Mexico or 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 the Caribbean and from Central America, et cetera. Mm. So there's that whole thing. And then there's also this aspect of um uh, yeah, you have first, second generation, third generation now of, of of Latinos, and that's a whole other thing. And there's this interesting piece of where, in my view, how I've written about this a little bit, I've talked about this plenty here, is my idea is that you have to conceptualize kind of what you're saying about the you know, very strong work ethic, very high employment rates, you know, that's kind of just like drilled into Latinos, you know, since you're, you know, since you're, mm -hmm. you know, a young kid, typically. Um which is you have to conceptualize, uh, I think, Latinos, if you want to find a, a kind of 
uh, uh, not a panacea, but some type of undercurrent of this, which is wherever they're living geographically, that's where they're going to adapt. And, and so in many ways, there is so many things, so many things about Latinos for the most part, I think there's obviously exceptions in different pockets here, but I think in general of with white working class people here in the U S they're, they're very analogous in terms of their values, in terms of hard work, in terms of, you know, a slight bent towards conservatism, I think in, in general, um, you know, some of the religious kinds of stuff, you know, there's, there's a lot of overlap. And, and, and when you, when you throw Latinos in the mix in a particular geographic region where there's also, you know, black or white working class folks, that's the, the class thing becomes the connective tissue there. And that I think is maybe an element of that. I'm not a sociologist, but I would say some of this is because class is the predominant or is the most proximate issue in most of latin america and so mm -hmm. most latin american countries it is class that is it is most arresting for for latinos so coming here is always for betterment economic you know uh, opportunities or opportunities in general better life etc so that's always going to drive things and uh, again on average and so this gets a little different when you get second third generation but even still, that's a kind of ethos of of, of Latinos in, in general. So, it it's not surprising <laughs> that you know uh, Latinos are 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 a complicated bunch, just because you know it's twenty three plus countries, and so just different places and different waves and you know, all that. But I think if you look at where they're landing geographically and how they're you know adapting with their environment, you can actually learn a little bit more. I think about Latinos than you know based on their their kind of where they're residing in their kind of mm -hmm. geographical pockets than um, than anything else. Uh, any other? Well, it's variation again. You know. A among it's true for asian americans too but uh -huh. you know, the, mm -hmm. the difference between like venezuelan americans and cuban americans and mexican mm -hmm. americans is and even like within mexico which part of mexico you're from oh yeah um mm -hmm. but i think it's really i think you've hit, hit on something really interesting here which is a you know maybe only tangentially related to this conversation about masculinity but i think it is related to it which is that you you've taken you've made a claim that there's actually the class consciousness the sense of kind of economics is really mm -hmm. the dominant theme but then in the us there's an attempt to slot latinos into a race race-based categorization and classification yeah, well, well we, we, see, we, one. we see what happens with that at the ballot box it doesn't work <laughs> no, no but but, it, but it, there's a deep it, so there but there's really there's lots of tropes about that which is oh they're socially conservative they've got you know blah 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 they like trump because he's masculine no there's but actually you're speaking something much deeper here which is actually stop stop defining us by race or ethnicity or rather don't stop but but actually stop weighting that so heavily versus our class position Mm -hmm. uh, um, and actually just kind of where we are economic. And if you do that, then some of the recent political trends make a whole lot more sense than the whole people of color stuff that the left got way to. Absolutely. I can ask Gosh. anybody in, in my family from different you know, family from all over Latin America. I can ask any one of them whenever they came here, whatever, you know, my, my, <laughs> my dad will say always best. He'll say, I, I'm voting for the guy that's gonna, you know, keep uh, keep, uh, keep jobs going for me, and you know, get a steady paycheck. That's that's my political position. That's it. Yeah. I don't care about any the other stuff's important. It's fine. It's you know, it's important, but that's that's what I. It's it's always econ or I should say mostly economic or class, and um, you know, because as you're saying, right, you know, Latinos in general are going to work. They're going to work hard, and they're going to they're going to they're going to usually try and work as best they can. So if yeah. they're putting a lot of effort there and they're not getting something back in term economically, that's where that that's this the, is, uh, this is piece. brings me to the, some of the politics of this is so frustrating because like the infrastructure bill, for example, mm -hmm. uh, was a massive is a massive job creator for working class men. Mm -hmm. 70% of the jobs will go to men, disproportionately Latino men. Mm -hmm. The only reason we know that is because a women's group did an analysis of the infrastructure bill to show how women were going to miss out on this historic investment because mm. it's 70 percent men but mm. it seems to me you could imagine a world where the biden administration rather than this that which who have said nothing about the fact that it's going to help working class men rather than that being an embarrassing bug 
of the infrastructure bill. How about it being a feature? That's a feature. How about it being? How, how about saying, look, That's college college loan forgiveness is going to help two two thirds of the, the debt is held by women, college loan debt, and there's a whole bunch of other things we're going to do for women. And obviously, they've got a whole thing about Roe right now, so they can say lots of stuff about women. Sure, but then say, by the way, this infrastructure bill, who mm-hmm. will it help most? Working class men, mm-hmm. and especially Latino working class men. I don't mm-hmm. I don't see why they wouldn't say that, but of course they haven't said that because they are stuck in zero sum thinking. They're worried what the women's groups will say. Meanwhile, we see this flight of working class Latinos, especially mm-hmm. men, to the Republicans. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I, I like at least take credit for the stuff you are doing, guys. <laughs> right, it's exactly what, that's exactly the problem. Yeah, especially when 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 such a still a large part of the voting block in the United States is you know white working class folks or just working class folks in general. That's still a big part of the voting block. So I would I would I don't. It, it kind of just seems like you're throwing away free political points if you're not Absolutely. talking to them and their needs. You're, leave, you're like, leaving. You're leaving. You're you're leaving votes on the table. And, That's right. And they think, and I don't think it would scare away white college educated women. I think they can think two thoughts at once. I I think I they'd agree. be okay with that. Well, I mean, we totally align on this, and it's. I mean, that's that's the that's the biggest frustration. Um, you know, in, in many of those ways, I guess the 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 one question I have here is, um, uh, you know, we've kind of talked about it, so maybe we just kind of close the loop on it. So you, you mentioned the, I think the second part of your book about, you know, problems of the political left and problems of the political right. So uh, let me just start with the right here for a minute. Uh, yeah, we have. Uh, certain figures that have become very popular about talking about men's issues, but they seem very, again, just like this kind of 1950s way of of doing things, very stuck in the mud kind of thing. What is it, I guess, the question I have here on the right is why are why does it that in, 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 the, in the general sense, conservatives feel like um, or when you hear about it, it has to be this like this, this again, this kind of schema or this script of this is what it is, and it can only be this. Why is it never, even if it's slow, right? I, I have cons- a lot of conservative friends. I, I'm fine with getting there, you know, slowly, gradually. Okay, that's fine. But it's like this allergy to like any forward thinking change on anything, even if it's like socially or culturally. I mean, maybe I know there's a few people out there that are on, on the right that are trying to do that, but they just get really drowned out. But, you know, many of the the very popular conservative thinkers that are, you know, selling out stadiums and, you know, saying all this stuff, you know, are are feeding this like, I mean, just like, I don't know, expired kind of milk of sorts of Mm -hmm. this like, you know, masculine bullshit. And it's like, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm not saying anything wrong with it. But that's not like to be a man is to be this 1950s like. I, I, why, why, why is there this allergy to kind of changing here? Well, it depends who you're talking about. For politicians, we, one of the most important things to know about Trump voters is that the majority of them thought that America was better in the 1950s than it is today. Mm-hmm. And so you've got this base. <laughs> Not for all groups. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. You don't have to think about it. But, but there's this nostalgia. There's this sense of like things, you know, and it is, you know the most important you know, word in Trump's Slogan was again, make America great again, mm-hmm. and so our, our our best our, our best future lies behind us, and we just need to go back. We just, mm-hmm. There's a bring there's a bring backery uh, of one kind or another in a lot of that thinking. So some of it I think is playing to that base, which is just look, all these changes are hard. Look, can, can we just go back to the way things were? Right? Mm-hmm. If you're in a period of change, whether it's in your personal life or mm-hmm. social, life, you know, or just for a whole society, change is hard. Even when it's driven by good forces, it's hard, and so. Oh, can't we go back to the way it was? Because it, mm-hmm. you know, it used to be so much easier then. It's childlike in a way, but but I understand it as an emotional thing. So they're playing to that base. I think that for some of the intellectuals, um, it is just this sense. I mean, here we think people like Jordan Peterson are a really good example. I think I treat him respectfully as a big massive listening ear uh, out there. And I I do think that he is just conservative in the sense that he 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 thinks the modern left has gone too far and too fast. I think he's a I think he's a more thoughtful conservative in some ways, which is just like how can we adapt to, to this change? I think that's the proper kind of conservatism, which would be to say here are some changes. Some of them are good, some of them not so good. But here's this big change in the role of women that has all kinds of consequences. Hmm. How as conservatives can we think about traditional institutions like the family, like fatherhood, 
Mm -hmm. employment in this new world and how can we help to adapt Mm. some of that is about slowing some of the change but mostly it's about helping people to to change but it requires i think a an acknowledgement that these changes have happened they're not going to change and that they are in many ways good and so we're in a we're in a we're in an adaptation period um but what we have is a sort of bring back nostalgia thing so i I do think it's back to this just exploiting Mm. that sense of disequilibrium and grievance to just I call it it's magic wandism. I mean, Josh Hawley is someone I've already mentioned, but he has, he has his own book. Well, he's, he's got a book out on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's coming out next year, Manhood. And yeah. when it actually comes to it, what is what are his solutions? Bring back manufacturing. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, good luck with that. I mean, that's yeah. really hard to do. Right. Um, and have a tax break for marriage in, in the federal tax code, which won't work. And so, and so you're like, first of all, clearly those are just, all that is, is just sort of, it's just a, it's, all he's trying to create is an atmosphere around the way things used to be mm-hmm. and this vague magic wandism that he can somehow miraculously bring it back when, of course, he can't. Whereas a more responsible conservative would be to say there are differences between men and women. All this you know, biology doesn't matter. Bullshit on the left is wrong. Mm-hmm. But we're in a world of equality now. Let's figure this out and do more on responsible fatherhood. Actually, Ron DeSantis mm-hmm. has a big initiative in Florida on responsible fatherhood. Mm-hmm. I think that's a real that's great terrain for conservatives is to really push the fatherhood thing. Yeah. But Hawley and the others are just like, bring back marriage, bring back marriages and factories. And I'm like, okay, good. thank you. Thank you, Senator Hawley. I'll, you know. <laughs> We'll get right on that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, okay, exactly. Yeah. I, I mean, I'll take it back to my Brookings colleagues. I'm sure we can come with some whizzy, whizzy policies to, I know, you know, you know what you need? The only, the only thing that would actually work to bring about the world that Josh Hawley wants is a time machine. Mm-hmm. That's right. Until, until and unless Josh Hawley invents a time machine, I'm not going to take anything he says on this subject seriously. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you on that. And then just on the left, you know, it's 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 all you know scorched earth, and it's just all we need to eradicate masculinity. We talked about this earlier. You know, it's all everything's patriarchy, everything's toxic masculinity. Uh, you mentioned the APA guidelines. I've spent hours on 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 uh, this podcast talking about that. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I'm not favorable about it in any way. No, uh, there's no there's a, there's a couple of good things in there, but it's drowned out by all the other bullshit in there, and they're just very politicized. So, I guess on the left, I mean, why are they like always, you know, taking? Uh, now what's happened is they're taking these very kind of like you know, extreme ideas of sorts. Um, you know, it's kind of flattening out where like everything is because of this or everything is because of this. And that's the answer literally to everything. Um, why is there no nuance or why is there no, you know, you know, there's this, there's some complicated things here. We can take some of that, but how do we also understand other elements? It's like, no, well, you're sexist. If you, if you think that, or, you know, you're, it's, it's just all of that kind of stuff. And there's no room for dialogue either. Why on the left does that happen? I think it's. I do think this is one of those cases where there is a similarity between the left uh-huh. and the right, and I know that there's a danger of both mm-hmm. sidesism, and there's a sort of intellectual vanity in seeming to rise above, you know, the absurdities of both sides. But on this case, in this occasion, I really do think we can rise above the absurdities of both sides, and it's partly because it's back to this zero sum thing. If we give these people an inch, they'll take a mile, mm-hmm. and it's also because particularly the, the the progressive left, specifically the more activist class, have just decided, actually, yeah, let's have a culture war and mm-hmm. let's win. Mm-hmm. And you don't and you don't win a war with nuance. No. Compromise. No, you, and no, you don't. yes, on the one hand, or on the other hand, you you win by taking a very clear ideological stance mm-hmm. and seizing it seizing the commanding heights of power and forcing your view through. And there are plenty of theocrats on the right who want to do the same thing now mm-hmm, as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and it's all about trying to win. And so in different ways, both sides have fallen into the same trap, which is the thinking that not only can a culture war be won, but that B, you should want to win it. Mm-hmm. One of the things that draws us here is that, is that it's pluralism. And so what I say to my progressive friends is, do you really want to live in a society where there are no no religious beliefs that you don't agree with? Mm-hmm. And they're not a single pro-life person. Mm-hmm. Would you just like to just expire? No, and maybe no masculinity at all. Like, if you really would, you do you really want? Do yeah. you really want that? And if the mm-hmm. answer is yes, I just can't talk to them anymore because mm-hmm. what we actually want is pluralism and right. diversity right. and complex. And because the world is complex, mm-hmm. we learn from each other. And that's I'm, I'm John Stuart Mill's biographer, and so <laughs> yeah. I have to believe this anyway. Just, 
the selection effect is why I wrote it, which is we we all of us have opinions. This is Mill now w- that are wrong. We just don't know which ones they are yet, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and it is only in constructive dialogue with us that we might learn which of our current opinions are in error. Mm-hmm. But if you walk around believing like you know you've got everything right, and it's just those stupid people over there who need to be bludgeoned into agreeing with you, right. then any nuance is a distraction. And we just talked about a few examples where, in the political sphere, just discussing the problems of boys and men. Mm. Would in some way be a distraction from ongoing concern for the for, for the problem, and it's just wrong. Mm-hmm. It's not how people think. The Democrats are just leaving votes on the table. Mm-hmm. It's zero sum culture war thinking. And I think if we're about to learn anything in this current political season, it's that well, Democrats don't win culture war battles, mm-hmm. <laughs> even if no, they no, can they, fight they, them because they those people have. are poor. Right? Never have to. Why? Why fight and, and try and just let's all try and be a bit better, mm-hmm. have a bit more grace. Mm-hmm. understand the other side of making some really good points mm-hmm. understand that we're all trying to raise our sons and daughters in a you know confusing world mm-hmm. um and try and figure it out together but we don't get anywhere by basically blinding one eye to the problem mm-hmm. the other side and, su- and assuming the worst if we if we lose the presumption of goodwill in our opponents and in the people we're disagreeing with them then we lose everything mm-hmm. at the heart of our, i think at the heart of this great experiment is the presumption of goodwill Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was just a last question here because uh, you've been generous with your time. Um, the last part of the book, you talk about um, some some ideas for solutions. You talk about uh, boys having an extra year of pre K. I, I know we didn't get to really get into that. You talk about more male teachers, which is important in, in vocational education. So, but but maybe just tell us about heal. I thought it was it was kind of like your uh, a- uh, analog, your your parallel to like kind of how STEM was for for women. So you kind of just heal for for men. Just kind of describe that and some of those ideas about some of the reforms that we could maybe do. Yeah, sure. So heal stands for health education administration and literacy and is as you correctly identify sort of a mirror image to stem mm-hmm. and those are jobs that would obviously include teaching but things like nursing psychology social work management uh, and the sorts of jobs that require communication skills hence the l for literacy as opposed to the m for math and whereas we've seen increasing numbers of women in stem jobs we've seen decreasing shares of men in heel jobs there are actually fewer and fewer men as a share in almost every heel profession. Nursing has gone up a little bit, mostly because of immigrants. It's about 12% of nurses are men now. Mm-hmm. But we've seen a near halving in the share of social workers who are men, mm-hmm. the share of psychologists who are men, and a decline in the number of teachers who are men. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a problem for three reasons. One, there's a lot of jobs coming in those sectors. Mm-hmm. Uh, that for my, by my calculations, for every job we're going to create in STEM between now and 2030, we're going to create three in these heel sectors. Mm-hmm. So there's jobs there. They're not all fantastically well paid, but not not all of the jobs being done by working class men now are fantastically well paid. Mm-hmm. And these jobs mm-hmm. will, are going to be there. And some of them are quite secure. Secondly, we have labor shortages in some of these fields. Mm-hmm. And thirdly, and probably most importantly for me now, I didn't think this when I wrote the book, but I do think it now. Actually, having men in those roles is very important for the people using those services. So let's take, I know you're interested in issues around mental health, for example. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in my health. world in psychology, yeah, it was 80, 20 or whatever it is. It's, I mean, all of my colleagues were female. All, of, all, of, all of my current coworkers are female. And the extraordinary thing is you only have to go back to the 80s and it was parity. Uh, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. And then we dropped from like 39% to 29% in the last decade. And among psychologists under the age of 30, mm-hmm. only 5% are male. Mm-hmm. And so this is an extraordinary feminization of a profession that used to be um, used to be um, for both. But I have to tell you, as someone who's been in therapy myself, and the issues I was dealing with, I wanted a male therapist. Sure. My kids having my kids in various ways having a therapist, in many cases did much better with a male therapist, sure. female therapist. The idea that that's just going to become impossible is just a huge problem for the users of those services as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so for all those reasons, for good economic reasons and for labor market reasons, but I think also just for human flourishing reasons, yeah. not to have men as social workers, teachers, carers, nurses, et cetera, for the people who are in hospitals and schools mm-hmm. and needing help, it is, I, I, I honestly think it's scandalous that no one's paying attention mm-hmm. to the growing feminization of those professions. And all and there's so much attention on getting more women into STEM jobs and you know, all the male professions, great. Mm-hmm. No attention is being paid 
to the fact that we have fewer and fewer men in those critical professions. Uh, and so I have a whole chapter on that. I have, I think we need male only scholarships to get some men into some of those, just as we do for women. We need subsidies for employers taking men. We have to diversify the workforces of those, uh, of those kinds of professions. It's a huge, huge mm. opportunity. Um, but it's also a huge need that as a society we're hugely fine. And I think it brings us back to where we were a moment ago around mm -hmm. new scripts for masculinity, right? We don't That's have right. to stop being men to be nurses and social That's workers right. and psychologists and so mm -hmm. on too. We might do it slightly differently mm -hmm. to the average woman on average, right? We're not asking you. You don't have to you don't have to check your masculinity at the door right. in order to enter those professions. And right now, too many people on the left think you do. Mm -hmm. uh, and no one on the right even cares about them. And mm -hmm. so I, as you can tell from this answer, it's an area I really want to do more work in. Yeah, uh, yeah. There's of course, really, I, I, I'm honestly, I am shocked by the trends, and I'm shocked by the lack of shock <laughs> discussion yeah, that's in right. society. Well, that's <laughs> right. Because <laughs> I'm like, wait, what? Yeah, right. <laughs> really? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. We're not gonna. You're not gonna be able to get a male therapist soon. It's, uh, it's, it's it's very very difficult. I will always be employable. Because, for, like, I'm okay. I'm you. good at my job. That's that's. Uh, I, I I feel I feel confident in that. But I've been doing it for a while. But just for the simple fact that I'm a dude, it's like, yeah, we don't. Right. We, there's nobody else. Like, if if yeah. someone calls and says I want a male therapist, it's like you got one choice, and you better like me, or if you don't, <laughs> you're gonna have to wait a while. I mean, that's just kind of you know. Many, many times at many, many, uh, you know, private practices and outpatient medical placements and, you know, even inpatient hospitals, like there's just not a lot of that. And so it is, it is, it is a, you know, kind of a, uh, endangered in some ways, if you think about it in terms of like extinction. Yeah. Like, we've we've spent it. so much political capital, so much money, um, on getting more women into STEM. Mm -hmm. And I strongly, I strongly agree with many of the, many of those yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, initiatives, but we're still doing it. And we need equal and equivalent efforts to get more men into heal. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, no, I agree. And we have to start. We have, given the trends, if we don't start soon, because mm -hmm. you get to a tipping point in occupational segregation, I think that's important to note is that once you get to a point where, and it looks to me like the magic number is around 30%, once a profession becomes more than about 70% of one sex or gender, same as colleges, by the way, or mm -hmm. any kind of institution, if you like being, being one of the, you know, 30%, that's okay. Right, mm -hmm. but you're now what do you what's you're now one of the twenty percent, fifteen percent, ten percent. Yeah, and so it starts to feel weird. Mm -hmm. And my own son, who works in early years education, where there are three percent male, mm -hmm. half oh, as yeah. many as there are women flying military jets as a share of the profession, like he gets all kinds of difficulty because he's oh, a yeah. guy working mm -hmm. in early years childcare. It goes, it's so transgressive that it raises all these questions. Whereas if you got to a point where you know thirty. 30% of primary school teachers, 40% of primary school were male, 35% of psychologists were male. It wouldn't right. be weird. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't have to face difficult questions. And most importantly, it would be easier to attract more boys and men into those professions mm -hmm. oh, yeah. because they would see a lot of guys doing it. Like someone mm -hmm. who sees you mm -hmm. and you're very, obvious, you're very obviously male. <laughs> yes. Uh, the last time I checked, yes. <laughs> and you, and you, you don't appear to be trying to hide it or embarrassed about nope. it or anything. Right? So you're unapologetically male and you're a mental health professional and you're having this dialogue. And so mm -hmm. you're modeling and you, in a way that makes, you know, I can imagine boys like seeing you, listening to you, seeing you and going, great. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's mm -hmm. a dude. And what do you do again? You have to mm -hmm. normalize those professions mm -hmm. for men in the same way we had to normalize professions like engineering and law and politics for women. Yeah. But we've, we, we, we've barely begun on that task. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. Well, the, the book is called Of Boys and Men, Why the Modern Male is Struggling, Why It Matters and What to Do About It. I can't recommend it highly enough. It is so good. It's fantastic. Uh, I think it's out everywhere, right? As you said, it's through Brookings. It's out everywhere now. Yeah. Yeah, it's out through the press, but it's, been, it's available in all formats, including the audio book read by myself. Oh, and very nice. Past, having passed the audition to play myself, I read the book. Uh, so <laughs> if you prefer great. to listen, nice. you can do that, Kindle, etc. Yeah, available mm -hmm. in all good bookstores and the usual places. Mm -hmm. And where can people find you or, or get at you and reach you? So my, uh, I'm Richard V. Reeves. And so if you just put a V between Richard and Reeves, you'll find me on Twitter. You'll find me on most social media platforms. That's my URL for my website. And I have a new Substack, 
which oh, is nice. called of, of Boys and Men, which is Very building nice. on some of the themes we've talked about uh, today, Xavier. So I really want to thank you for having me on. No, thank you. It's been, been such an honor and delight. I, I really enjoyed the conversation. So, so thank you so much. Thank you.